So uh, a couple quick announcements before we get going today. So uh, because we've had a number of people out sick um, in general or out sick because of COVID or we're going to be out for sports or other activities um, that will impact our first quiz this Friday, and what I'm going to do is we're going to have the first quiz um, online through Notebook. So basically what I will do is I'll open up the quiz at 8 a.m. Friday morning, and then you'll have 90 minutes, so time and a half to accommodate students who have ARC um, accommodations for extra time. And you'll have from 8 a.m. Friday morning until 11.59 Sunday night. Any time in that period, you'll have 90 minutes from when you start the test to finish the test. So that way folks that are out sick or have COVID and are in isolation can still um, participate or folks that are going to be out for sporting events, swim, lacrosse, other things. Yes? If we're in class, does that mean we have to take the quiz during class time? Or is it no, so you could, you could take it at 1 p.m. on Saturday, you could take it at 8.02 p.m. Friday morning, and it'll be up to you. So we won't have a physical class in here Friday. Normally we'd be here and we'd do the test on paper in person, um, but instead we'll do this um, remotely through Notebook. So I'll send out um, more instructions for folks, but just so you have an idea. So 90 minutes once you start the quiz, but any time from 8 a.m. Friday morning to 11.59 on Sunday. Um, just make sure you don't wait until you know, 11 p.m. to start it if you think you're going to need more than one hour since it'll close at 11.59. Is the quiz also longer than two multiple choice questions for the section? Or is that just it is, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like 15 points for multiple choice questions. Yeah, it's really going to test your knowledge on four questions and that's it. No, there'll be approximately 10 to 15 true and false, 10 to 15 multiple choice, and then one um, short essay. Sorry, I'm still putting the quiz together so I didn't have uh, a full sample to give you, but just to give you a sense of what those will be like. So. Other questions? Um, so just a reminder, I did post the study guide for the first quiz covering weeks one through four, so up through today's lecture um, in Notebook, and I pinned that to our uh, sort of bulletin chat. Uh, like using like the study guide and stuff, how do you like recommend that I was like preparing and stuff? Just like looking over it, like taking notes or stuff? Like, yeah, so uh, a couple of sort of tips to help you. In general, when there's important terms or concepts, I've, I'm trying to highlight them in bold in the text. So as you go through and look at the study guide, you'll see that there are a number of places that the text have been um, bolded. So definitely pay attention to those, um, you know, key terms, for example, like hyperglobalist or global pessimist, global skeptics, and then you would talk about, right, the three types of justice globalism um, that you talk about. So that would be uh, sort of one. So pay attention to those emphasized um, terms. The other one is think about sort of the, within each of the chapters, so thinking about, uh, you know, the history of globalization, the kind of key issues that we talked about in the very beginning that are interested global scholars and global studies, or international studies in particular, the economic aspects of globalization, the political, the cultural. If you have a sense of sort of what's the broad picture there, so if you think about political globalization, what are some of the big dynamics, such as you know, the emergence of global governance, the impacts of League of Nations and creation of UN and other global institutions. And if you have a sense of sort of the big uh, overarching picture for each of those themes, that'll help you when it comes to filling out the essay at the end there, because it'll basically ask you to critically reflect on some of the kind of bigger concepts you've been talking about. So those are the two main tips I'd suggest, paying attention to those um, bolded key terms, and then make sure you have kind of a clear sense of what's the overarching argument for each of the main chapters. Other questions? Okay. So today we're wrapping up our sort of discussion of this book and thinking about some of the key possible future trends related to globalization, which we'll come back to and revisit in more detail when we get into the Extreme Economies book next, particularly in relationship to the last three sections, which are looking at sort of globalization and the future. But building on our discussion about different global ideologies and these three forms of justice globalism, our author Steger argues right, that there are a number of, at least he and other scholars have identified, kind of key challenges that 
we are facing when we think about the future in relationship to issues of the global. Right? So one is sort of this broad issue of environmental politics at a global level and how we think about protecting the planet, everything from climate change to biodiversity loss to rising sea levels to deforestation habitat loss. Some of the issues that we discussed thinking about the environmental aspects of globalization. The second big challenge that Steger identifies thinking about globalization in the future is how we go about reducing global inequality as we talked about in relationship both to economic globalization and some other dynamics, we know that globalization is increasing the general sort of livelihood of people around the world, but who's benefiting and how equally or unequally those benefits are being distributed is a key question that continues to drive these debates, and particularly in the debate between the market globalists who argue right, everyone benefits from globalization and the justice globalists who argue, well, actually, no, not everyone benefits. It tends to be those of the political and economic elites within an individual nation or at a global level. So how do we think about addressing these issues of global um, inequity? And then finally, how do we go about strengthening human security? Right, so this can include everything from human and labor rights to issues of gender justice. How do we think about what it means to create a more sort of peaceful and just world? And what role do uh, debates about global citizenship, migration, ownership of media, politics at a national, regional, or international level, how do we think about these, particularly in relationship to the future? As you can see there, the, the 13 climate action, the 10 reduced inequalities, and the 16 peace and justice, those come from the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs developed by the United Nations. And these are just a few of the many um, sort of framing concepts that the United Nations and other countries working with them have tried to use to think about these different aspects of human security. And then I added a fourth one there that our author doesn't mention, but I think is probably an equally important part of thinking about these future challenges, which is how we continue to manage and wrestle with um, technology and new technological innovations. And we'll look at this in more detail later on in the semester. Um, but as we you know, have read about already in some of the chapters, there's questions about what happens in a, a global environment where a smaller number of corporations increasingly have more control over the media that's being produced and the media that we consume, and how does that impact the way we think about and engage in a whole range of political issues, as well as how do we think about the possible ethical challenges as we move increasingly towards the use of artificial intelligence smart cars, self-driving autonomous vehicles, autonomous drones and warfare and many other contexts. Worries about, you know, is my job going to be outsourced to a computer 20 years from now? And so how do we think about managing those technological issues as both more people in the world become more embedded in these technologies, smartphones, computers in particular, but also as they become an increasing driving force behind um, politics? And we'll look at this in much more detail later on when we look at the example of um, Tallinn in Estonia, sort of a capital in a country that's bet most of its future in the aftermath of the Cold War on moving increasingly to virtual governance, online voting, online banking, essentially doing everything or almost everything in the state as a citizen through um, online virtual portals. So how do we think about those kind of challenges? Those of you that follow the news may have heard about the huge treasury seizure of, I think it was $3.5 billion in cryptocurrencies from a Bitcoin trading scheme that had been going on, right? the largest seizure in history of the Justice Department. These are all part of that question about technology, globalization, and the future. As Steger talks about, we think about these different driving dynamics, the political, the economic, the cultural, the ideological, the environmental aspects of globalization, he suggests there's three kind of possible future scenarios that we might see emerging. One is that we'll see an increasing backlash against globalization. This is the rise of nationalist populism that we talked about on Monday, and more broadly, the increasing support for nationalist politics around the world, and the growing discourse sort of criticizing not only political elites, but the idea of globalism right, itself, 
you think about the President Trump's message there when he was inaugurated in 2016 about America First, his speech in 2018 at the UN sort of against global, the ideology of globalism and uh, criticizing multilateralism, and how that dynamic will continue to shape the future, Steger argues, will be a key part of how we think about everything from possible trade wars to military armed conflicts to the movement of peoples around the world. The second future sort of trajectory he talks about is the revival of globalism, or sort of a reformed globalism, particularly the kind of market globalism, sort of the neoliberal economics that, as we've seen, sort of built and gave us the modern sort of economy and governance framework after World War II. That possibly we'll see kind of a revival of support um, for these global governance institutions, things like the UN, International Criminal Court, NATO, and others, and a decline of populism, particularly if at a national level, um, nationalist parties or populist parties um, don't do well in elections and voters sort of reject those parties or those candidates. Right, so our author was writing kind of 2019 right before the 2020 election, so he didn't have sort of the foresight to think about you know, how that would change, but he might argue you know, the election of Biden over Trump was, at least in that specific context, possibly a rejection of some of that kind of populist rhetoric and a return to try to re-embrace right, UN, U.S. rejoining the Paris Climate Summit, trying to renegotiate um, some kind of a uh, new political arrangement with Iran after the U.S. had backed out of the earlier Iran nuclear deal. And so all of these could be examples that our author might point to if he was kind of revising his chapter today about this tension between a revived globalism and declining populism. And then the finally, the third sort of option he talks about that could be a possibility is a sort of a stalemate between a sort of reformed globalism and a weakened populism. And he argues that, at least in his mind, at that point when he was writing, this seemed like the most likely future trajectory where the kind of center and right would reach some kind of a political stalemate where neither could gain a majority, and they would have to continue to figure out how do we uh, work together despite these political differences. And so thinking about the sort of tension that's led to a stalling of legislation that we heard about in the Australian case on Monday, what we've seen in our own Congress here in the United States, and the challenge of how do you get um, large legislation or important um, political debates moving when you have a deeply divided um, political system, which regardless of what country we're talking about. Right, we're seeing this play out in um, Ottawa and other parts of Canada right now around the vaccine mandates, possibly in um, New Zealand now soon as well. So Steger argues that these are the three kind of likely future dynamics that we are facing. And in particular, in that sort of first one, increasing backlash against globalization, right, we can think about how it would impact increasing um, role of migrants and refugees, whether it's people fleeing military conflicts or political insecurity or economic and climate-related issues. So a backlash against globalization would have likely strong impacts on that movement of peoples, particularly if it's a very sort of anti-migrant or anti-immigrant sort of politics. Steger also worries that, that if we sort of go down that first possible path, we're likely to see a continuing decline of democracy and an increasing sort of role or spread of authoritarian politics, particularly tied to these populist strongman figures. And then finally, as I was just saying, there's the worry that if we continue down that path, the more likely that countries will abandon these broader global governance and multilateral institutions, and that itself will further weaken the global system that at least in theory, was put in place after World War II to keep us from going into um, more major conflicts. And so those are at least three kind of key drivers within this first trend um, that we could think about. The uh, next one, the sort of second, is this revival of globalism and a decline of populism. And as Sager notes there, right, this could be essentially just a a slight tweak to the existing sort of free market neoliberal economics that we've been talking about that is sort of embodied by the market globalism, that sort of ideology we looked at on Monday, 
There may be minor sort of tweaks around the edges, but nothing um, dramatic would take place. He suggests that we might see an increasing emphasis, particularly by sort of political and economic leaders, on this idea that we're moving into a sort of globalization 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution, driven by um, big tech, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, all these new digital technologies, cryptocurrencies, and others, and that that will become an important part of sort of helping to revive a new sort of wave of support for globalism and more market globalism in particular. But the worry there, as he notes, is that as we become increasingly embedded and reliant on these technologies, issues about surveillance, the idea of surveillance capitalism in particular, where um, no longer are the things that we're interested in the product, but we ourselves become the product that's being bought and sold through advertising and sort of clicks and likes through social media and other platforms, increasing reliance on biometric data, on RFID chip technologies, QR codes, and in some parts of the world, increasing video surveillance where everything you're doing is being watched and monitored and recorded and then analyzed at some point, either by state officials or private entities in order to figure out how to control or monetize um, certain actions um, and uh, not others. So these are three possible trends that our author talks about should we go down that second sort of path of a revived globalism and a decline of populism. The third sort of scenario, some of the details that our author talks about there, thinking about the sort of stalemate between globalism and populism, as I said, this is the one that he argues seems most likely, is that the center and right-wing parties will reach some kind of a sort of Cold War stalemate or a balance of power where neither side can sort of dictate their particular political agenda or economic policies, and they have to figure out some middle ground between the two of them. He also suggests that there could be a possibility of a revival of more support for Green Party politics and the sort of ideas and arguments that are embodied in sort of global justice ideology that we talked about, in part as a pushback in response to the sort of perceived failures of market globalism and the sort of center-right political parties. Right, so you could argue that we're seeing bits and pieces of that in different countries and national elections. Chile and other parts of the world where this tension about what political direction should the country go in is being sort of decided every two or four years based on new uh, popular votes. And then finally, Steger worries about the possibility of a sort of deeper global systemic crisis, and particularly one that leads to sort of a cascading series of interconnected crises. Right? And we can think about When Steger wrote this, we hadn't moved into a global pandemic yet. So is the COVID-19 pandemic particularly or uh, sort of uniquely embodying the idea of a global systemic crisis that he was perhaps worried about that could lead to sort of the further breakdown of these global um, connections? So I want us to um, think a little bit more about these questions and how we make sense of them. So we're going to spend the rest of class today in some different breakout groups talking about sort of two questions that Steger raises for us at the end of this chapter.